seems like most of you in the audience are familiar with that song, but for those of you who don't know, that was the theme to Kuch Kuch Hota Hai. It's a great movie, Shah Rukh Khan, Kajol, very 90s. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. But uh, more broadly, what you just experienced, both uh, with your ears and with your eyes, is a new sort of instrument. Uh, it's a data visualization instrument. And uh, for the time being, I'm calling it the Synthoviz. But that's not a very good name, so I'm definitely open to new suggestions. Uh, so today I'm going to show you how we can use the basic principles of data visualization to invent just such an instrument. And uh, hopefully in the process, I'm going to show you how visualizing data can enhance our understanding of the world, uh, can help us create new ideas, and help us think new thoughts. So first, uh, Okay, so for the first interlude, let's just talk about what is data visualization. It's probably a term you've heard before. Maybe it conjures images of charts or graphs or word clouds. But at its core, what data visualization is, is just the process of mapping attributes of data to visual attributes. So we have attributes of data, we have visual attributes, and we're going to connect them with each other. Uh, and the reason that we do this, just generally speaking, is that our visual systems, the human visual system, is extremely powerful and capable of processing a lot of information uh, very quickly and, in fact, automatically, even involuntarily. For example, when you look at a bar chart, you don't need to think or to concentrate to determine which bar is the longest or to get some pretty good sense of what the relative lengths of the bars are. Uh, if you were to look at that same data uh, in a table or in a spreadsheet, it would be necessary to read all of the values, uh, to do some mental computation to determine which one is the largest, and even more mental computation to determine what their relative values are. And so when we visualize data, what we're doing is we're offloading that cognitive task to our visual system, and we let our minds do more higher level reasoning. Uh, to create new ideas and think new thoughts. Okay, but that's all pretty abstract, right? So data visualization is the process of ma mapping uh, attributes from data to visual attributes. But in the context of the synthoviz, that instrument that you just saw, what does that mean? So we're going to map the attributes of a musical note. That's our data. So when you have a song, the notes are the data. You know, an individual music note is a data point. And we're going to take the attributes of that note and we're going to map them to the circle. That's what the synthoviz does. So what are the attributes of a musical note? Well, probably the most important one, the one that is easiest to detect, is its pitch, how high or low the note is. Uh, also important and easy to detect is its duration, so how long the note is played for. And we could imagine maybe visualizing other attributes of a note, its volume, how high or how loud or soft it is. Uh, you could also potentially visualize its timbre or its tone. Right? So for example, notes that are played on an electric guitar with a lot of distortion have a different sound quality than those played on a flute. But uh, for the purposes of our demonstration today, we're just going to be keeping it simple and mapping pitch and duration. OK, so we have pitch and duration. Those are our attributes of the data. And what can we map them to visually? In other words, what are the attributes of a circle? Well, probably the easiest one to think of is its size, right? how big the circle is. In geometric terms, what's its radius? Uh, you also have color. Humans are pretty good at detecting the differences in color between objects. And finally, uh, perhaps the most powerful visual channel that we have at our disposal, position. Right? We're very good at detecting even subtle differences with great precision of objects on a two-dimensional plane. So we're going to be taking advantage of that with the synthobits. Okay, so now that we have the theory out of the way, let's get back to our instrument and see how this works in practice. Right? So what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to remove all of the visual encodings. 
So we're going to have map the node to a circle, but there won't be any other visual encodings happening, and we can see what that looks like. Okay, so not very interesting, not very useful. So uh, what we can do at first is see what happens if we create a linguistic encoding, right? If we put the names of the notes onto the circles. Okay, so that's not useless. It provides some information. We have the name of the note on a C major scale. But uh, it definitely lacks the kind of intuitive power of the original demonstration. So let's make our first visual encodings. Uh, first one that we're going to do is we're going to map the pitch of the note to the circle's size. And maybe you can imagine in your mind uh, what that might look like if we map the pitch of the note to the circle's size. getting somewhere, um, slightly better than the linguistic encoding, but let's go further and map the pitch of the note to the color of the circle. Okay, we're going to map pitch to color. All right, so uh, this is kind of nice. And by the way, this is in data visualization terminology. This is called a redundant encoding. We have used two visual attributes, right? namely the size and the color of the circle, to represent one dimension of data, just the pitch of the note. And there's nothing inherently wrong with redundant encodings, but maybe we can improve this visualization by taking the size of the circle, which is currently mapped to the pitch of the note, and map it instead to the duration of the note. So we're going to take the size of the circle and map it to the, how long the note is played. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. And we still have the sharpest arrow in our quiver, right? The best, uh, maybe the best encoding of all, um, and that is the circle's position. So since we have three visual attributes to choose from, but only two data attributes, we have to use position now as a redundant encoding. So first, let's try mapping the note's duration to the circle's position. Okay, so we're mapping the note's duration, how long it is, to the position of the circle. So you can see it kind of exploding out. Um, and it looks cool, but uh, it's not particularly useful for us. It doesn't really provide much insight. So uh, what we're going to do instead is we're going to uh, map the note's pitch to the circle's position. See what happens. And that looks a lot better to me. It's, uh, it has that sort of emotional intuitiveness uh, that we wanted. And in fact, now our visual encodings are so powerful that the linguistic component, the, uh, the letters of the notes, isn't really doing anything for us anymore. So we're just going to go ahead and get rid of that. began. But let's try to go a little further. So uh, as the famous computer scientist Ben Schneiderman has said, uh, the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. And I think so far Synthoviz has succeeded in producing some beautiful pictures, but it doesn't provide us much insight about the, uh, the music that we've been playing. Now fortunately, data visualization can also be used to depict events that happened in the past. Um, and that allows our powerful visual systems to detect patterns and gain insight. So far, uh, we've just been visualizing notes in real time, but what happens if we use the synthoviz to peer into the recent past? 
Okay. So this here is a visualization of all of the notes that I've played since the beginning of this talk. And uh, the encodings are exactly the same. So uh, the duration of the note is mapped to the size of the circle, and the pitch of the note is mapped to both the color and the position of the circle. And so if I play one very long high note, we should see a big blue circle show up somewhere on the right. Let's see what happens. Uh, so there it is, taking up a lot of space now. Uh, so to get a better sense of this visual recording device, uh, we're going to reset our notes and watch what happens when we play a tune from scratch. Okay. I'll try something different this time. seen Star Wars or any of those movies, you've probably heard that melody many times before. But I think it's fun to visualize it because it's such a common melody and it's nice to see it in a new way. And uh, let's just talk about this visualization here for a minute. So uh, when I look at this viz, I notice that there seems to be some relationship between the duration of the notes and their pitches. So what happens if we use the most powerful encoding at our disposal, position, to compare the duration of the notes? Okay, falling off the screen there a little bit, but I think you get a, a decent sense of what's going on here. Uh, so the pattern becomes much more clear when we use this kind of encoding. The, uh, the longest notes we can see are those Ds, which is where the melody ends. And then we have the low and high Cs just below that. Uh, that's sort of either end of the C major scale. And uh, the tune also has some medium length Gs there, which are kind of in purple, and then the Fes and Ds. And then all the way to the left, you can see three very small Cs, which I played bum, 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 in between both melodies when I repeated it. Okay, and uh, finally, just for fun, I wanna see what happens when we do a triply redundant encoding. So uh, we're also going to map color to duration as well. Ooh. It's not very useful, but I just think it looks nice. And it lets us do this too. All right. So suppose we want to now do some more useful analysis. We want to get all scientific about this. Uh, so suppose we want to find out how many of each pitch was played. So we can start by just grouping the notes together, or grouping all the different pitches together. So, group them like that, and group them like that. And I'm starting to get a decent, uh, at least the beginning of a sense of how many of each pitch was played, but the size of the circles is really throwing me off. Uh, so I'm just going to get rid of that encoding completely. I'm not going to use size for anything at all. Uh, Okay, so this is maybe slightly better, but it's also kind of jumbled up. So it's very hard to detect subtle differences between the number of notes played in each pitch unless I actually count them. And the whole reason that data visualization is powerful is that uh, it takes advantage of mental processes that happen automatically, right, without any effort at all. And so if I have to count it, it kind of defeats the purpose of the whole thing. So to accomplish this task, we're going to use the most powerful chart of all. That's right, the bar chart. Now at this point, you might be thinking, for the last 10 minutes or so, this guy's been showing us all these crazy moving circles, changing color, now he wants us to get excited about a bar chart. What's the deal with that? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
So, brief history of the bar chart. Now, today bar charts are everywhere. It would be hard to even be a person in 2018 without ever having seen one. Uh, which is why it surprises a lot of people to learn that the bar chart is actually a relatively recent invention. Uh, so this here is the first ever bar chart, uh, as far as historians are concerned. It was created by William Playfair and published in his Commercial and Political Atlas in 1786. 1786, so that means that in India, the Mughal Empire was already on the decline. It means that uh, Shah Jahan, you know, maybe he may have built the Taj Mahal, but he never in his life saw a bar chart. <laughs> Pretty wild. And the bar chart is deceptively simple, but I think the reason that we see it everywhere, the reason that it's uh, survived the test of time, the reason that it's so powerful, is that it takes advantage of the fact that we humans are really, really good at the detecting differences in the lengths of objects, particularly when those objects are lined up on the same baseline. Right? And this is the reason that bar charts are so much more powerful than pie charts, because pie charts force us to compare objects relative areas, and that's a thing that we're just not as good at doing, especially not with any precision. So, in homage to William Playfair and to Bollywood, I'm going to end this talk by turning Kuch Kuch Hota Hai into a bar chart. See how it goes. Kuch Kuch Hota Hai as a bar show.